fetch his body to reach it. I waited until he had his back to me, with his hands raised high in the air, reaching for the window frame. And I opened my purse, took out the gun, aimed very carefully at a spot just in the center of his left shoulder blade, and pulled the trigger four times. Sally! He didn't immediately fall. He had his fingers over the window ledge, ready to unfasten the catch when the bullets hit him. With some terrible effort, he dug his nails into the stucco to keep himself from dying. Once he tried to turn his face and look at me, but he hadn't that much life left. At last, he fell. I bent and looked at my husband's body. He was quite dead. I wiped off the gun, his gun, and threw it behind an acacia bush. And I walked back to the car, slowly and carefully removing any of my footprints which showed in the loose dirt of the road. I dusted my shoes and drove home. I put the car in the garage and went in and had my shower and lay down in the library to wait. A few minutes after the grandfather clock struck 11, the telephone rang. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Skinner? Uh, This is she. Uh, This is Jonathan Brown at the sheriff's office. I uh, have some bad news for you. Oh, what is it? Mr. Skinner, ma'am. He's been killed. Mrs. Skinner? Hello, Mrs. Skinner? Are you all right? I waited quietly for a moment, then I let the phone fall to the floor. I listened until I heard Jonathan Brown hang up, at which time I replaced my telephone on its stand and went into the kitchen for some ice, which I put in a large Turkish towel. I then arranged myself on the living room divan and again waited. Mrs. Skinner? In in here, please. Oh, oh, yes. Thank you. Are you all right, Mrs. Skinner? That was a stupid thing for me to do, breaking the news that way, you know. I'm, I'm all right. I came over as soon as you, well, you know, dropped the phone. I, I felt faint suddenly. And no wonder. Tell me what happened, uh, Mr. Brown. Jonathan Brown from the sheriff's office. Uh, Mr. Brown, please sit down. Oh, thank you. Well, your husband was up at the Johnson house uh, this afternoon, as well as we can figure, up there on the side of the mountain, you know. Uh, He must have been trying to get into the window, and somehow somebody, well, shot him. Sure you want me to tell you? I'm sorry. Go go on, please. We uh, looked around the place, couldn't see anything, although we found the, uh, you know, weapon... It was a gun. Found it in the brush near where he was, uh... Uh... No footprints or anything. To think that my husband shot... Uh, There, there, there. Uh, Terrible shock. There, now. Thank you. I'll I'll be all right. Oh, don't you worry about a thing, Mrs. Skinner. Best uh, thing for you to do right now is rest and take it easy. Thank you for your help. You've been most kind... The only thing I think you'll have to do will be make an appearance at the coroner's inquest. Unless you're still not feeling well, you know. In which case, I guess maybe you shouldn't be there. Oh, no. No, thank you, Mr. Brown. You let me know when you need me, and I'll be there. I slept very well that night. How much better a position I would hold is the tragic widow and as the discarded wife of a successful man. The next few days, a few photographers and newspaper men called, but they were kind and gentle and didn't make too much bother. Finally, Mr. Jonathan Brown called to say that he would send a car for me on Friday morning, the next day, as it turned out, to take me to the coroner's inquest. The small courtroom was crowded, and almost everyone there eyed me with great sympathy. The inquest proceeded evenly, and... There was as yet no evidence as to the identity of my husband's murderer. 
I uh, have had this blackboard brought into court so that I might show the position of the body when found. I think it might be of interest. Proceed. Now, the body was found just below the first story window on the left side of the house. The dead man was obviously trying to gain admittance, you know. He didn't die immediately, as I will show you, but stayed alive long enough to try to keep himself from falling, since marks from each of his fingernails were found running down the side of the building. Here, then, is the windowsill. Here are the marks of his fingernails. And here is the spot where the body lay when it was discovered. As he talked, he watched me did this, Mr. Brown. And I didn't know why until I heard the first scrape of the chalk against the blackboard. For one awful moment, it was the sound that had been made by my husband as he tried so desperately to hold himself alive. I found myself tightly clutching the wooden table in front of me, my arms and body tense, trying not to faint. Now, since a large deposit of the dried stucco from the building was found under each of the victim's fingernails, I believe I can best illustrate the manner of the victim's last moments with a physical illustration. Now, suppose I am the victim, you know, and this blackboard is the side of the building. We hear gunshots, and then the victim slowly sinks to the ground. Please, don't make that... that noise. Autolite is bringing you Miss Ann Baxter with Joseph Kearns in The Thirteenth Sound. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, uh, Joe, any more sound effects for the Autolite Stay Full battery? Why, sure, Harlow. Ah, that's the water that gives the Autolite Stay Full battery over three times the liquid protection of batteries without Stay Full features. That's why this famous battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And what's this, Harlow? Why, that's the dependable starting power of the Autolite Stay Full. Every positive plate is protected with fiberglass retaining mats to prevent shedding and flaking and keep the power-producing materials in place for longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. And friends, you'll be as happy as a lark with the greater convenience and dependable starting power of the Autolite Stay Full battery. Only your neighborhood Autolite battery dealer has the Autolite Stay Full, and he's equipped to give you the best in battery advice and service. So see him, and he'll make sure that you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Ann Baxter in Elliot Lewis's production of The Thirteenth Sound, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I must have been taken home from the inquest, for the next consciousness I had was lying on my bed. The house was quiet. Off to one side of the room, an old pipe hanging from between his teeth, sat Mr. Jonathan Brown from the sheriff's office. Feeling better? Oh, thank you. I, I'm terribly sorry to have oh, done... That's all right. I thought maybe you better not go, you know. It's quite a strain. Yes, it, it was quite a strain. The coroner asked whether it'd be all right to go on without you. Everyone seemed agreed, you know, so we finished up while the doc looked you over. What happened? He said you'd be all right. Shock. No, no, I meant about my husband. He meant his death at the hand of person or persons unknown, you know. Is there anything further I must do? Not a thing, Mrs. Skinner. Oh, you've been very kind. Well, it's a terrible thing happened to you. I'll be going now. If there's nothing more you need from me. Oh, nothing, thank you. Well, goodbye then. And don't you worry. We'll find who did it, you know. After he had left, I had the time to be angry at myself for my behavior at the inquest. What must the people have thought? To faint only from the noise of a piece of chalk on a blackboard. I wondered if Mr. Brown had suspected anything, because, as I remembered... He'd been watching me as he drew those silly little diagrams on the board. 
He hadn't been looking anywhere else. Not at the coroner, or any of the reporters, or even at what he was doing. He had been looking at me. Well, of course he was looking at me. He was showing his sympathy. I slowly allowed myself to return to my former position in the community. And as I'd anticipated, I was greeted with respect and admiration. Poor dear Mrs. Skinner, how tragic. The first evening I accepted an invitation was five weeks after my husband's death for bridge at the country club. Oh, I, I'm terribly sorry. I, I wonder if you'd forgive me. Is something wrong, Melissa? Well, I have a terrible headache. I'm afraid I've strained my eyes. Oh, my, why don't you lie down for a few minutes? Well, if you wouldn't mind. Why not at all? Would you care for an aspirin tablet, Melissa? Oh, thank you, no. If I could just lie down, I... I told you that you needed new glasses. Now I suppose you'll get them. Locking the bar... I'll get you comfortably settled. Oh, don't bother, please. You go right ahead with your game. I, I'm sorry to be such a nuisance. Oh, poor dear. That is uncomfortable. There's something it don't pay to neglect. Your eyes, you know. Mr. Brown. Good evening. I didn't see you come in. Uh, you know these... Uh, oh, Sure. Good evening, Mr. Gregg, Mrs. Gregg. Good evening, Mr. Brown. Uh, good evening, Would you Mr. object Brown. to a new partner? Considered a fairly good whist, Pinochle and Bridge Man. We'd be delighted, Mr. Brown. Please join us. Yes, please do. Yeah. Yes, yes, very kind of you. No sense starting a new game. I'll just pick up where the lady went away. Splendid. Then I believe it's my deal. <laughs> I hope I deal myself a good hand. I've had atrocious luck all evening. Maybe I can change it for you. Yes, maybe you can. Incidentally, Mrs. Skinner, I always meant to ask you whether or not you minded noises especially. Uh, sharp noises, like, what? say, uh, chalk on a blackboard. I... I don't understand. Chalk on a blackboard? At the inquest. Uh, I always wondered about it. You fainted just when the chalk was scratching across the blackboard. I don't remember hearing it. I'm afraid I fainted before you drew any diagrams. I... Assume that's what you were planning to do, uh, draw diagrams? That's what I was planning to do, yes, ma'am. Yes. Ah, oh, there we are. Oh, I, I'm sorry, let me... Uh, that's all right. I can reach them. I... Something wrong, Mrs. Skinner? I... I didn't... <sighs> Again it happened. And again, as the noise was made, it sounded to me like my husband's fingernails sliding down the rough side of the Johnson house. And again, as I slipped into darkness, I could see that Mr. Brown was watching me. I stayed at home for the next few days. I canceled all appointments. By Friday... Of that week, the musical group of which I was chairman was giving a concert of chamber music, which I had to attend. I went to the music hall alone. I was studying my program when Mr. Jonathan Brown entered. I tried to avoid his eyes, but he came directly over to where I was sitting and took the place immediately next to me. Is this seat taken? Oh, good evening, Mr. Brown. Mrs. Skinner. Well, good evening. I didn't recognize you, you know. I was to be joined later. Oh, I'll uh, just sit here a moment then. Ah, uh, you know, uh, I'm terribly sorry about the other night. Oh, there's really nothing at all for you to be sorry about. It's very kind of you to say that, you know, but I do feel guilty as all sin being the cause of your getting sick. Well, really, Mr. Brown, I wasn't sick at all. It was very close at the club that night, if you remember. Yes, ma'am, it was. Well, just so I don't feel it was my fault, you know. No, I don't want you to feel it. It was your fault. Well, that's very kind of you, you know. Oh, if you don't mind, I'll stay till whoever holds this seat gets here. That's quite all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, and uh, welcome. We uh, crave your indulgence and a certain open-mindedness for giving a fair chance to the first piece with which we're going to open our program this evening. The uh, title of this piece is The Thirteenth Sound, and the composer is Julian Creel. Now, this piece is what you call, uh, I, I guess, modern music, and the Really unusual thing about it is that the instruments play in quarter tones. Now, a quarter tone is somewhere 
in between the other tones like we're accustomed to hearing. So on this following piece, the instruments are not playing like you would think, out of tune. This is the way it's supposed to sound. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, tune up, Jim. This should be very interesting, don't you think, Mrs. Skinner? The 13th Psalm. Uh, have you heard it? Oh, what? No. No, no, I haven't. Too hot again, Mrs. Skinner? It does get stuffy in here, you know. I'm... I'm all right. It's hot in here. Oh, you look terribly peaked. You sure you're all right? I'm... I'm quite all... Excuse me. I left Mr. Brown sitting on the rented folding chair. My man drove me home. I've never liked modern music. I locked all the doors and I turned on all the lights. And I did a foolish thing. I found a hammer and a piece of board, and I beat on the board with the hammer as hard as I could, and finally the heavy, steady pounding that I made drove the other sharp, shrill, awful noise from my mind. <laughs> and I turned out all the lights, opened the windows, and went to sleep. I didn't sleep well, but I didn't stay awake either. I hadn't set the alarm next to my bed when I first awoke the next morning. For a minute, I couldn't remember what had happened. I felt drugged. And I heard the gardener mowing my lawn, and I looked around my room and saw all my familiar possessions. It had been the heat. Both times that I had fainted, it had been close in the room. And the first time it had happened, at the inquest, I had been overwrought and disturbed. Anyone would have fainted at her husband's inquest. There was nothing strange about that. I looked at his picture on my dressing table. He looked so smug and safe. How happy I was to be rid of him. I got out of bed and put on a lovely chartreuse brocade housecoat I'd just gotten and went downstairs. And then I heard... What? I didn't know. I didn't care. I knew only that I had to stop it before it happened to me again. Stop it! Please, stop it! Pardon me, Mr. Skinner? Get out of here. Who told you to do your work here? Did someone tell you to make that noise near my house? No, ma'am. The lawnmower wasn't cutting. I had to sharpen it. Get out! Go on, get off this property at once! Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Go on, don't ever come back, you hear? Don't ever come back! Good morning, Mrs. Skinner. It's a lovely day. I turned and ran back to my living room. I stood shivering there in a beam of sunlight. I waited for him to come bursting into the room after me. I waited. But nothing happened. No one came into the house. I turned and looked. Mr. Brown was walking slowly out my front gate. His shoulders seemed a little more stooped than usual. But he was leaving. I went up to my room. I knew what I must do. I carefully packed all my clothes because I was going away. Halfway through my packing, I went downstairs for my coffee, and then the doorbell rang. Uh, who is it? It's Miss Gray. Oh, just a moment. Uh, come in. Did I disturb you? Uh, no, not at all. Oh, well, then I will not come in, but I can only stay a minute. Uh, would you like some coffee? Oh, no, thank you. When I was so sick, you remember, the doctor absolutely forbade me having any more coffee. Oh, I didn't know that. Sit down, please. Um, do, do you drink much coffee? Uh, why do you ask? Well, I thought perhaps on account of your recent attacks might have been caused by that. Mr. Gregg is an exponent of aspirin and salt tablets. I think it's much simpler than that. Just cut out the coffee. I, I think my attacks were just caused by this heat. I'm planning to go away, where it's cooler. Oh, how splendid. That will certainly help you. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to be disrespectful, heaven knows, but perhaps you might meet a fine young man who will... Well, perhaps. Uh, when do you plan to leave? Tomorrow morning. I'm leaving for New York. Oh, that's terrible. I, I beg your pardon? Oh, the clubhouse. 
The unveiling ceremonies are the day after tomorrow. We assumed that you'd be there for the ceremonies. Oh, oh, I'd forgotten. And you simply can't leave. Why, I don't even know what we'd do without you. The day after tomorrow? You'd really need almost all that time to properly pack. And we have no one who can replace you on the speaker's platform. All right, then, Mrs. Gregor. I'll stay for the ceremonies. So I put off my trip. I packed carefully for it and stayed at home for the two days. I made my reservations and prepared to close my house. The day of the unveiling, I ordered my bag sent to the station, gave directions to the caretaker, and then drove to the new clubhouse with Mr. and Mrs. Gregg. The building was really very lovely. It was almost ready for occupancy. This day, we were unveiling an heroic figure which graced the entranceway. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> yes, very. You ladies have done a marvelous job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> What's that fellow doing up there? Where? Well, see, up on the roof. The workman? Oh, yes. I, it makes me nervous to see people at such heights. He is awfully close to the edge. Oh, he knows his business, I imagine. Yes. I'm very anxious to hear your little talk, Mrs. Skinner. Thank you. Well... I think we should get on with it, eh? Why, I believe it'll only be a few more minutes. Oh, no, no. Uh, what? What? What is it? Well, good heavens, look. That workman, he, he's going to fall. Well, uh, uh, can't someone catch him? He's, he's hanging on to that rope. Oh, some of the men are running up there now. No, they, they've got to catch him. They will, they will. No, no, Oh, he's no. falling. I did it. What? I did it. Nonsense, Mrs. Skinner. You had nothing to do with it. I did it. I killed him. I did it. Oh, you don't know what you're saying. You're upset. I did it. I killed him. I did Mrs. it. Mrs. Skinner, let me take you home. You're not well. I killed him. Oh, let me take you home, Mrs. Skinner. I killed him. Listen to me. Don't you understand? I understand. I killed him, Mr. Brown. Stop that noise. Can't you hear it? I killed him. I killed him. I know. I know, I ma'am. Killed... It's going to be all right, oh, you know. Can... You just come oh. along with me. Oh. You sign it, Jonathan? Uh-huh. Shame. Yeah. People do funny things. Yeah. Did you pay the fellow? Uh-huh. He's very clever. Sure is. I really thought he was falling off that building. He used to be an acrobat. Uh -huh. How'd he make that noise? He was holding ten penny nails in his hand. Scraped them along the face of the buildings. He slid down the rope. He's an awful racket. Uh-huh. Ah, pity. Nice lady, you know. Yeah. What the devil are you doing? Huh? Huh? Fixing my nails, I guess. Well, cut it out, will you? Sure. What's the matter with you? That noise makes me nervous, I guess. You know? <laughs> Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Miss Ann Baxter. Friends, this is Harlow Wilcox again to remind you that Autolite is the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. In 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats, including famous Autolite Stayful batteries carried by your neighborhood Autolite battery dealer. See him soon and ask for an Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Miss Rosalind Russell in When the Bow Breaks. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Phil Harris and Alice Fay, Charles Boyer, and Jeff Chandler, all on Suspense.
Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The 13th Sound was written for Suspense by Elliot and Kathy Lewis. In tonight's cast, Joseph Kearns was heard as Mr. Brown, Florence Bates as Mrs. Gregg, and Norman Field as Mr. Gregg. Others in the cast were Howard McNair, Sarah Selby, Anthony Barrett, Jim Nusser, and John Stevenson. Our sincere thanks to 20th Century Fox Studios who made possible Ann Baxter's appearance tonight. Watch for Miss Baxter's appearance in that studio's forthcoming production, Follow the Sun. And remember, next week on Suspense, Miss Rosalind Russell as a woman who holds death over her husband's head. A tale we call When the Bow Breaks. You can buy Autolite staple batteries, Autolite standard type or resistor type spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Important progress is being made against cancer through the American Cancer Society's research and education programs. Join the 1951 Cancer Crusade. Mail your contribution now to Cancer, care of your local post office. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.